tonight we're going to talk about seizures and anticonvulsants. We all deal with seizures um, fairly commonly. Um, the overall incidence in our pet population is about two to three percent with certain breeds um, having a, a higher incidence of seizures and then cats have a, a lower incidence. Basically seizures are the clinical manifestation of excessive electrical activity within the forebrain, which is the cerebrum and the thalamus. We do not see seizures with lesions in the cerebellum or the brainstem. Basically, there's an imbalance between excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmission, and this is mediated by different neurotransmitters. There are some that are inhibitory and some that are excitatory, and um, some electrolyte channels. And these are basically the targets of our medications that we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. Again, seizures originate from the forebrain. So that's an important um, to keep in mind when animals come in with, with certain symptoms, which we'll also talk about. Um, sometimes there's the big question of, are we actually dealing with a seizure? There's four main components to seizures. Uh, the one that the owners typically recognize may be the aura. Oftentimes they don't see a prodrome, um, but a lot of owners can recognize an aura. Their dog or occasionally their cat will have pretty typical signs that they exhibit before they actually go into a seizure. And if this is the case, I think we can use this in some of our patients to actually initiate treatment sometimes before they actually go into a full seizure, if they, they have a repeatable aura that the owner can recognize. Ictus is the actual seizure, and then we have the postictal phase, which can vary between animals. And some can be just a few minutes, and some patients it can be hours. One thing I wanted to mention is seizures themselves do not equate with epilepsy. Epilepsy is a condition where patients have multiple seizures over a period of time from an intracranial cause, which can be a secondary intracranial cause um, occasionally, but um, from an intracranial cause over more than 24 hours apart. When we talk about seizures and their appearance, we have two main types. We have generalized epileptic seizures, which are our classic tonic-clonic seizures, but they can also take the form of atonic seizures where their dogs almost have a flaccid paralysis, which can be difficult to distinguish from a syncopal event. Um, we can have absent seizures, which are also um, very difficult um, to diagnose. And then we have um, focal seizures. Um, and these can consist of sometimes simple um, focal seizures involving just twitching of one side of the face or one side of the body to more complex events. But these are very subjective. And so simple versus complex is not very meaningful to distinguish between. It doesn't affect our treatment and it's not necessarily associated with a specific underlying cause. We can actually see dogs with idiopathic epilepsy that only have focal seizures um, and don't always have more complex or um, generalized seizures. So the, the terms grand mal, which was the old term for a generalized um, kind of tonic-clonic seizure has fallen out of phase. And same thing for petite mal um, was the term that was used to describe a focal seizure. Seizures can either be self-limiting they can occur as clusters where they have more than two in a 24 hour period, or we can see status epilepticus, which is continuous seizure activity for five minutes or greater. So I think we can all recognize that this is a generalized chronic clonic seizure. This is easy to recognize, especially if your client brings you a video, there's no doubt what um, is going on with this patient. So this is a focal seizure, and it used to be thought that focal seizures were more likely associated with structural lesions of the brain, but that's since been 
found to not always be true. So we can see something like this from idiopathic epilepsy as well. Then we have things like this, which some people will say is a focal complex seizure. And at this point, we still don't know exactly what this is. Um, we'd refer to this as fly biting. Um, some people call them fly biting seizures. I, I don't necessarily call it that. Um, in my experience, most of these patients don't respond to anticonvulsants. Um, so I think that for the, for the most part, these events are, are not truly seizures. But I think there's different etiologies for, for something like this, and it's not always due to the same thing. But most of the patients I've seen for fly biting do not respond favorably to anticonvulsants. And then we have something like this, which probably a lot of people at this point recognize that this is most likely Okay. idiopathic head tremors that we see in certain breeds of dogs and is not thought to be a seizure, although we can have seizures that look like this. And you can't always distinguish, but when I see a certain breed that has events like this, where the owners can distract them, get them to stop, then I would feel pretty comfortable calling this an idiopathic head tremor and not a seizure. When it comes to seizures, first, we try to dis establish this is a seizure. Next step is trying to figure out, is this epilepsy, in which case, what is causing it? Or are these seizures due to something occurring outside of the brain, which would be a reactive seizure? When it comes to epilepsy, we have Currently, which we'll talk about three classifications. We have idiopathic epilepsy. We have symptomatic or structural epilepsy, and then probably symptomatic or unknown cause. Early terminology classified seizures into primary epilepsy. And this is where there's no structural cerebral pathology that we can identify. And then there was secondary or acquired epilepsy. These are, this is patients that have epilepsy secondary to an identifiable structural lesion within the cerebrum, whether that's a tumor, inflammation, a stroke, those would all fall in that category. Then there was the category of cryptogenic epilepsy, which meant we don't think this patient has primary epilepsy. We can't identify anything structurally wrong with their brain. Blood work's normal, but this patient is not otherwise normal, but we can't figure out why they're having seizures. So they would fall into to this category. The current proposed terminology now consists of idiopathic epilepsy, symptomatic epilepsy, and probably or possibly symptomatic epilepsy, um, which I, I'm not a huge fan of these terms. Um, I think idiopathic epilepsy, we all kind of get. These are patients that, again, we don't suspect have any progressive intracranial um, abnormalities to account for their seizures. It's probably genetic in most patients. Symptomatic epilepsy are these patients where we can identify a cerebral lesion, such as a tumor, again, or encephalitis. And then the probably or possibly ones are the ones where, you know, they have evidence clinically that something's going on in their brain, but we can't identify it. So the proposed terminology that was proposed in 2015, but hasn't been officially adopted <clears throat> is, is keeping the term idiopathic epilepsy, which, but they're, to, to be in this category that's a little bit more strict um, guidelines, they're supposed to have a proven genetic background or suspected, and again, no indication of structural epilepsy. Structural epilepsy is what we just talked about. We can find the lesion if we image these patients. And then the last cause, which I think is um, better is just unknown cause. 
this could be a patient that that comes in um, they're circling they're not mentally appropriate but we do all the tests and, and we just can't find a, a reason um, for their seizures all right so idiopathic epilepsy is it is more common in in purebred dogs but we definitely can see it um, in mixed breeds it's not as common in cats as it is in dogs but but it's definitely still one of the more common causes of seizures in cats. These are some of the breeds that we know have a genetic predisposition for idiopathic epilepsy. The most common age of onset is between the age of one and five. Um, there's been some patients that have documented to have idiopathic epilepsy starting as young as two months of age, um, but the, the more common time frame is between the age of one and five most of these patients tend to have seizures at night um, or when they're at rest. This is something that I often talk to clients about. And in some ways, I think it can give them some peace of mind. I think all of our clients who have patients with epilepsy worry constantly when they're not there, especially during the day at work. What if their dog's at home seizuring all day and they're not aware of it? And I think maybe it helps some people to know that it, it's fairly uncommon for dogs to have a lot of seizures during the day. Most of my patients with epilepsy, you know, their seizures are often really late at night or early in the morning. And, and that's typical. The most important thing about these dogs is they are normal. Um, in between seizures. Once they've recovered from their postictal period, they come in, they should have a normal neurological exam. So if you've examined these patients shortly after having a seizure and you find a mild abnormality, then I don't get too hung up on that. I try to examine these patients when they've not had a seizure and make sure that they're normal. Structural epilepsy, again, is these patients that have identifiable lesions, such as a tumor, um, a congenital malformation like hydrocephalus, falls into this category. Most of these patients are going to have abnormalities on their exam, but early on, seizures can be the only abnormality. These patients can present and be normal on exam, um, you know, they've maybe had a seizure within the last few days or week and they come in and they're normal, but eventually most of them will have abnormalities that develop. Um, occasionally we see some dogs with kind of a moderate hydrocephalus that have seizures as their only symptom um, and they don't ever develop other signs. I just wanted to briefly touch on meningoencephalitis because it is a, a, a not uncommon cause of seizures in certain breeds of dogs, um, pugs, Yorkies, Maltese's. Um, it typically presents about the same time that idiopathic epilepsy would, which is why I bring it up. I'm always a little bit cautious about diagnosing idiopathic epilepsy in a three-year-old pug, even if they seem normal initially. These guys can seem normal initially, but then, um, they, they can progress pretty quickly. We're more suspicious of brain tumors when dogs present with seizures over the age of six with no prior history. Cats, it's closer to nine years of age um, before they tend to be um, symptomatic from a brain tumor. But any dog over the age of six, especially large breed dogs or brachycephalic, Brachycephalics tend to get um, gliomas, which often occur at a younger age. Some of these guys that have gliomas are five years old when they come in. So they're still within that range where could this be idiopathic epilepsy, but most of the time they're going to have other signs besides seizures like visual deficits, abnormal mentation, circling. We can also see Tumors that spread to the brain, um, the most common ones are mammary or prostate carcinomas, and then hemangiosarcomas um, can also spread to the brain, and these dogs don't always have neurological signs initially. Epilepsy of unknown cause, again, are these patients that we suspect have a cause that we just can't identify. Some of those could include something like prior head trauma, 
global ischemia or hypoxic event to the brain, or even something that happens um, during birth. Reactive seizures are not classified as epilepsy. These are patients that are having seizures secondary to something going on systemically with them. These are patients with low blood sugar, electrolyte imbalances, um, portosystemic shunts. So again, the first uh, step is trying to figure out, is this a seizure? Other things that can mimic hard to distinguish from seizures mainly include syncope, some behavioral abnormalities, acute vestibular events, narcolepsy, episodic weakness, and even pain. I've had a patient present before whose owner thought the dog was having seizures until she finally got a video for me. And instead um, the dog was having muscle spasms in its neck from severe cervical pain, but that would come and go. Basic things that should be done in any patient having seizures would be to do a physical and neurological exam, get a minimum database, and then depending on their signalment, bile acids, a potential thyroid panel, although hypothyroidism is not necessarily a direct cause of seizures, but can cause some other neurological signs and predispose patients to vascular events that can cause seizures potentially chest and abdominal imaging. And then ultimately, if we suspect this patient has a primary intracranial lesion, an MRI is going to give us the best chance of getting an answer. Important things to think about when getting a seizure history is obviously the signalment. Um, is, do they know of any littermates or parents of this dog that had seizures? Was there a history of head trauma? Um, again, a description of the event, the event is there, you know, is this happening at rest, which is typical of seizures, or is this happening when the patient's active, which is very unusual for seizures. If I have a patient come in whose owner is describing seizures that only occur when the patient is doing some sort of activity, it makes me question whether or not we're truly doing with dealing with seizures or more likely dealing with seizures secondary to a systemic problem and not a primary intracranial disease. Preferable to examine these patients between seizures and not right after they've had a seizure. Any abnormalities that you find shortly after a seizure may not be truly representative of something going on in the brain. Things such as blindness, walking in circles, even ataxia can be seen in any animal, regardless of the cause of seizures as a post-ictal change. Something I wanted to bring up is the big distinction between symptoms we see with a forebrain lesion versus symptoms we see from um, a brainstem lesion. This chart helps show some of the, the differences so I, I get this question not unfrequently. Um, and one of the other conditions I said that it can be hard to distinguish between seizures or vestibular events. And if an animal comes in that has obvious vestibular signs, such as a head tilt or nystagmus or significant ataxia, but yet the clients coming in saying their dog had a seizure, it really makes me question could, did this patient really have a seizure if they're showing vestibular signs? Because vestibular signs originate from a brainstem problem or potentially an inner ear problem. Seizures do not originate from that part of the brain. So if we have a patient that's truly having seizures, but yet also has vestibular signs, that could indicate they have a multifocal problem in their brain. The kind of the hallmark of patients with a forebrain lesion is patients that are circling but are not significantly ataxic. They um, often have abnormal mentation. They don't have a head tilt. So if you have a patient that's circling without a head tilt, they're not falling over, they seem a little dull, 
I would be thinking more for brain, not vestibular disease. And the main reason to think about that is the differentials can include similar things. Tumors can cause brainstem problems or forebrain, so can encephalitis, but then we can see other conditions that more often affect the brainstem as compared to the forebrain. For advanced imaging, we have a CT and MRI for looking at the brain. When it comes to something like a big contrast enhancing tumor within the cerebrum, CT is usually gonna get you a diagnosis. If we're dealing with something like a stroke or something like meningoencephalitis, we can certainly miss that on a CT and we can even miss some brain tumors on CT if they're not super enhancing, which some of our gliomas are not, which is why when it comes to imaging the brain, MRI is definitely preferred. MRI, <clears throat> you can see the MRI here on the right and the CT on the left. And with MRI, we can see distinction between white and gray matter. We can see inflammation. We can see the ventricles very well. With CT, the gray and white matter, you can't really distinguish between those. So it's harder to pick up um, subtle lesions. Again, you have a big contrast enhancing tumor, it's going to show up uh, on a CT as well. The other big um, advantage to MRI is we can image in multiple planes, which we cannot do with a CT. So MRI will, requ will acquire images in three different planes. I often get the question from clients and from um, other veterinarians is when, when should we start treatment for a patient with seizures? And there's lots of different answers. When it comes to people, they have pretty well-defined criteria as to when medication should be started. And that's if a patient has an identifiable cerebral lesion or if they have interictal EEG discharges, if they have that, they know there's a 90% chance these patients are gonna continue to have seizures and treatment should be started. Or if people have marked postictal adverse effects. It's been shown that in people, there's no benefit to starting treatment after a single seizure, but the earlier in treatment, that the earlier treatment is started, the better outcome they may have. That's something that we don't necessarily talk about in animals or, or necessarily know, but I suspect that it's similar, that the longer we wait to start treatment for our patients, the less likely it is that they're going to respond to treatment. I don't think a dog with a single seizure or a cat with a single seizure needs to go on an anticonvulsant, but I often see patients come in who've been having seizures for a year, occasionally longer, once a month or every six weeks, but treatment wasn't started because they hadn't become more frequent. But when they do become more frequent and we start treatment, those patients don't tend to respond as well to the anticonvulsant um, in, in my experience, there was a, um, ACVIM, con ACVIM consensus statement that came out, I think in 2019 or 2020 that went over anticonvulsants, went over when to start treatments, those sort of things. And out of that statement, they, um, it was a board of a bunch of different neurologists, both in academia and private practice. They, um, their recommendation was that patients that have two seizure events within six months should be started on an anticonvulsant. I will say that is not how I typically treat patients. I personally would not put my own dog on an anticonvulsant who only had two seizures. Um, if they were, you know, six months apart, I basically try to establish a trend. 
But if we had a patient come in that had a seizure and then six months later had a second seizure, I wouldn't necessarily start it, but we say the next seizure is in three months. I think you, we, we need to start thinking about getting these patients on anticonvulsants. If a patient has an episode of cluster seizures or status epilepticus, I always recommend starting an anticonvulsant. There are times when these patients can come off of anticonvulsants going forward. Um, if they come in for status epilepticus secondary to something like a toxin, they may not need to be on an anticonvulsant for life, but they should be started on an anticonvulsant at that time. If I have a patient that's had a seizure that we know has a structural lesion in their brain, such as a tumor, I would start that patient on an anticonvulsant, even if they've had one seizure, because we know they're going to have more. If patients have a very prolonged or severe postictal period, especially if they show aggression, I recommend starting them on an anticonvulsant, doing everything possible to try to prevent that. Starting a patient on an anticonvulsant does not mean they can never come off of that. I also get that question a lot from clients. They're reluctant to put their dog or, or their cat on a seizure medication because they've been told, well, you're gonna have to use this the rest of your, you know, your pet's life. And most of the time it's true because they need it but if there's severe side effects, they're not happy with it, you can stop these medications and we'll talk about that. They typically need to be tapered off and not stopped, stopped abruptly, but medication can be discontinued. The goal of treatment is to try to decrease the, the frequency and the duration and the severity of, of seizures while also trying to minimize side effects. And again, while treatment may be lifelong, especially if these patients have idiopathic epilepsy, there is the option to stop it if there's, if there's a problem. I always try to talk to clients about our goals when starting anticonvulsant therapy, but try to also be realistic and not, clients shouldn't expect their, their animal to become seizure-free. And I try to warn people that actually up to a third of patients with idiopathic epilepsy will not attain good seizure control, no matter what medications we prescribe. And I think just trying to make them aware of that can help. Sometimes patients come to me because they've had a few seizures and they expected their, their dog to not have any further seizures once medication was started. So client, client education is very important. If a patient does not respond to two anti-seizure medications of appropriate dosage and frequency, that's when they're considered to be refractory. And so again, that's about a third of all epileptic can be refractory to medication. This is the same for, for people. It's not a phenomenon just that we see in animals. People with epilepsy are the same way. The big difference is if a person is refractory to medications, there's other options, and we don't have a lot of those other options for our patients. My goal is to always start with one drug. I, I rarely start with two. I always try to start with one drug and try to maximize that drug before I start this patient on a second drug. If I start on Something like Keppra at a, a typical starting dose, the patient is still having more seizures than we'd like. I don't start a second drug at that point. I go up on the first drug, whatever drug it is I started, until either we've approached the high end of the therapeutic level, if it's a drug where we monitor levels, or the patient's having side effects that the owner's not happy with, that's when I'll then add in another drug. The other thing to keep in mind is we can't assess whether or not the drug is helping until they've been on it long enough and we know that they've reached steady state. If a patient is started on phenobarbital, that's gonna take two weeks before they reach steady state. So I always tell clients up until that point from when we start it until two weeks, we can't count that time period. So if there's seizures during that time period, we're just gonna kind of ignore it until we know the drug has reached steady state and then we'll 
start our time clock at that point. A positive response to any anticonvulsant is defined as a decrease in seizure frequency of 50%. So a positive response to treatment is gonna be different for every patient, depending on how often were they having seizures before you started medication. If a patient's having seizures every two weeks and now it drops to every four, that's considered a positive response. The client may not be happy with that, but technically that's considered to be a positive response to medication. Depending on the drug used, we you know, may check drug levels. The, when checking a drug level, it's important to know when does this drug reach steady state. Steady state is reached after four to five half-lives. So knowing the half-life of your drug can, will determine when we, we check uh, a level. We'll talk about which drugs we, we check. I usually check a level once I start a new drug and I know they've reached steady state. If I need to change the dose of the drug, occasionally when I add on another drug that I know might affect the metabolism of the first drug, then we might need to check a level. With some drugs, we consider checking levels with diet change, such as KBR, or if there's some sort of systemic disease that might affect the metabolism of the drug. So we're going to move into treatment. This is the, the main focus of the talk. Regardless of the cause of the seizures, unless it's seizures secondary to a systemic problem like hypoglycemia, the treatment is not necessarily different for different causes of seizures. There's not a certain anticonvulsant that's shown to be more effective for a dog with a brain tumor versus a dog with prior head trauma versus a patient with encephalitis. So I try to tailor the treatment to the patient based on what the owner can, can do, um, what the owner can afford, what side effects um, do I think this patient can tolerate? And what have they been on before they got to me? They're often coming to me and they've already, they're already on some drugs. So that's something that I, I often have to take into account. Phenobarb is still the most commonly used anticonvulsant. It's typically dosed at two to three mg per kg twice a day. It takes 10 to 14 days to reach steady state. And the common side effects that we see are sedation, ataxia, PUPD, polyphagia. I always warn clients, this is common. They're most pronounced when we start the drug, but the PUPD, the polyphagia, usually are persistent as long as the, the patient is on the drug. Hepatotoxicity from phenobarbital is not common. While we can see it, it's not common. That's the one that clients are most concerned about, but it does require monitoring to try to reduce the risk of hepatotoxicity. Other uncommon side effects are blood dyscrasias. We can see um, pancytopenia, um, but this is thought to be rare. We can see some um, skin stuff. So this is what our patients usually look like after they've been on phenobarbital for a little bit. Phenobarbital is exclusively metabolized by the liver. And because of the induction of P450 enzymes, it can affect the meta metabolism of other drugs, including other anticonvulsants. We expect to see elevated liver enzymes in these patients. That does not mean they have hepatotoxicity. ALP can go up to seven times normal, and that does not mean they have hepatotoxicity. If I'm concerned about it, I'll run um, bowel acids, but I don't do that routinely on, on every patient on phenobarbital. I typically check a CBC and a chemistry once to twice a year, depending on the patient and how they're doing along with the phenobarbital level. The advantages about phenobarbital is we know it's effective in a large percentage of dogs with seizures. It's still pretty inexpensive. We can give it twice a day and it can become effective in about two weeks. The downsides are the side effects. The, that's a big one, one that clients um, often are concerned about, especially the hepatotoxicity. 
it definitely requires drug monitoring. If we don't monitor it appropriately, that's when we're more at risk of running into pedotoxicity. There are quite a few drug interactions. Mitotain was a big one, which it, I know is not used as often anymore with tralistane. Um, but you basically can't treat a, a dog with Cushing's with mitotain and, and phenobarbital if they're on phenobarbital. It will lower your thyroid levels, including free T4, and it can cause TSH to go up. So we essentially cannot diagnose a dog with hypothyroidism just based on blood testing when they're on phenobarbital. Another big downside is this is a controlled substance, which didn't seem to be that big a deal until more recently, now that we're, we're not prescribing or, or dispensing more than five days of controlled substances for clients. And so they, we script this out for all, all of our patients. And I have a lot of clients who are calling because the pharmacy will not refill their medication. Um, they, they dropped a pill or they, they're trying to go out of town and the pharmacy often will not dispense it, you know, even one day early from when they are supposed to be picking it up. Potassium bromide is another commonly used anticonvulsant. There's some thought that potassium bromide may be better for dogs with cluster seizures. The main thought behind that is the half-life of the drug is so long that once it reaches steady state, there's very little fluctuation of the drug um, within the patient. So this may be better for dogs with cluster seizures. I'm not aware of any specific studies that have been done looking at that. This is all kind of anecdotal. The half-life of this drug is three weeks. So if we multiply that by five, we can see it takes a long time for, for this drug to reach steady state. The side effects of potassium bromide are very similar to what we see in phenobarbital, other than it does not affect the liver. It causes PUPD, it causes sedation, ataxia, polyphagia. I think the ataxia and sedation that we see with KBR is often more pronounced than what we see with phenobarbital. And I try to warn clients about that. It can also, mainly when combined with phenobarbital, potentially cause pancreatitis. There are reports of megasophagus. And then pneumonitis in cats. So it's not, not something that I would use in a cat at this point. We, we have some other options. It's eliminated entirely by the kidneys. It does not cause kidney failure or harm the kidneys, but if animals have kidney disease, you may have to reduce the dose of bromide. The other very important thing with this drug to warn clients about is they have to maintain a fairly consistent diet. There's not a specific diet that these patients need to be on. It's more about consistency. If they change the diet to a diet that has a different salt content than what the dog had previously been on, it causes the body to excrete more of the bromide. And so it can cause a drop in a level, or if you do the opposite, then you can have more bromide absorbed and the level can go up. And there is a condition that we can see when dogs develop toxicity um, to bromide called bromism. And this can even sometimes be seen when dogs have a normal level, but at the higher end of the therapeutic level. I've seen it, I think twice. It's very uncommon but it's most often seen in patients who are not being monitored, um, who, whose drug levels are not being monitored. The treatment is to either lower the dose or if the patients are experiencing some of these more side effects, then you can fluid diarrhea some and that will get the bromide out of their system quicker. The advantages to bromide is again, it can be a very effective drug it's fairly inexpensive. It does not affect the liver. This would be a, a good choice for a patient that has liver problems. Um, it can be given once a day with the long half-life. The downside, again, with this one is side effects. 
the need for it to be compounded currently, the added expense of drug monitoring, in the long, long time to reach steady state, a patient that's having seizures weekly, to me, it's hard to get them on a drug like this. That's going to take three to four months before this, you know, necessarily makes a huge difference in, in that patient. Oral diazepam is a potential anticonvulsant that can be used in cats and dogs. I say potential because it's, it's not something that I would use really in a dog. The half-life in dogs is so short that for this to actually be somewhat effective in a dog, we would have to dose it at a minimum of four times a day. It has a longer half-life in cats, so you can dose it in cats two to three times a day. There is the risk of hepatic necrosis in cats, but again, I don't think this is effective for dogs, it has such a short duration of action. The other thing that we can see if if patients are given oral diazepam, they develop tolerance to it very quickly. And then if they do end up needing emergency treatment for seizures, they can actually um, not be as, um, like IV value may not be as effective for these patients if they've been on oral value. So that brings us to other anticonvulsants that we can use besides phenobarbital and potassium bromide. I'm using other drugs, depending on the situation, often as our, my first line, but they're, they're still often used as a, a second drug. I think when we've maxed out phenobarbital or potassium bromide, and these patients are still having more seizures than, than the client is happy with, we think about adding on some of these other drugs or animals where we just want to try to avoid some of the side effects that we see with phenobarbital or potassium bromide, we can start with some of these other drugs. Keppra is one that I'm sure most people are familiar with at this point. Initially, Keppra had to be given three times a day. It only came as an immediate um, release tablet. The dosing of that is 20 milligrams per kilogram every eight hours. And I stress every eight hours and not just three times a day. I've had clients on this medication that, you know, I always ask at this point, what time are you giving your medication? Some clients are say, I give it at 6 a.m. before I leave for work. I give it again at 6 p.m. when I get home. And then I give it at 10 p.m. when I go to bed. It's not effective when used that way. If clients cannot get close to a every eight hour schedule, I don't think we should use this drug. I think we're, we're kind of wasting their time. So it's important to know that. And it's also important to know that 20 mg per kg is just a starting dose. This is a very safe medication. And if they're on a 20 mg per kg and they're still having more seizures than than acceptable, I will double the dose and even triple the dose before I reach for another drug. This drug has a very unique mechanism of action that we, we don't see in any of our other anticonvulsants. So if a patient's not responding to other anticonvulsants, possible that we may get a response with Keppra because it works so differently. The half-life is very short in dogs, which is why it has to be dosed every eight hours to be effective. Although there's some evidence that maybe it does have some anti-seizure effects that are longer lasting than what the half-life would suggest. Side effects with Keppra are potentially mild sedation and mild ataxia. Again, it's very safe. I do not check drug levels when it comes to Keppra. We actually don't have true levels established for cats or dogs. The levels that we use are extrapolated from people. So we're not even sure if this is what we should be using in our patients. Because it's so safe, I, I don't check a level. I just escalate the dose until effectiveness. Or if I'm approaching a 60 mg per, per kg dose three times a day and it's not effective, then I start to question, is this drug really going to ever work for this patient? The extended release Keppra has been a game changer, I think, for, for being able to use this drug more often. Not many people can do proper dosing of the immediate release and give it every eight hours. 
the extended release has allowed us to be able to dose it twice a day. The dosing is a little bit higher. It's a minimum of 30 mg per kg twice a day. And again, that's a starting dose. I, I try not to ever go below that. And you can definitely go up. I will easily go up to 60, sometimes 70, 80 mg per kg on this drug um, if needed. Right now, it's only available in 500 and 750 milligram tablets which does make it difficult to give in little dogs. That's the, the big downside to the extended release is because of the extended release tablets, you cannot break these tablets. So you cannot dose this at 250 you know, milligrams twice a day. The lowest dose you can use is 500. So for a five kg dog, that would be starting them at you know, 100 mg per kg twice a day which is potentially safe to do, but they might be profoundly sedate. So I typically don't use this in anything under 10 kilograms. The other thing to warn clients about with extended release tablets is they may see the tablet pass in their feces and they can look like they're intact, but they've absorbed the active ingredient through the tablet. Advantages to Keppra in general are it has very minimal side effects. It's very, very safe, does not affect the liver or any other internal organs. It has a very, very quick onset. It can actually be used for emergency treatment for dogs that present actively seizing. It can be used to help with um, cluster seizures at home, which we'll talk about. The downsides are if you're having to use regular Keppra, it does need to be, you know, Q8 hour dosing. There's been some question about effectiveness and then the cost. The regular Keppra, I think at this point is, is not very expensive. The extended release can be depending on, on where you get it from. So nisamide is another anticonvulsant that I like very much and use quite commonly. It is twice a day. The initial dose is five mg per kg as long as it's not being used with phenobarbital. So if you're starting this as your first line treatment, you can start at five mg per kg. If you have a patient already on phenobarbital and you're adding this on, then you have to start at at least 10 mg per kg due to increased metabolism of this drug by phenobarbital. And those again are also starting doses. Those are not max dosages. I've gone probably only up to 20 mg per kg twice a day in patients. When we get that high, they'll often start having a decreased appetite um, or some nausea, occasionally more sedation but it is safe, safe to go that high. The half-life in, in dogs is 15 hours, so it reaches steady state in three to four days, which is nice. Cats have a longer half-life, so it takes a little bit longer to reach steady state, but the benefit of it having a longer half-life in cats is it can actually be dosed once a day in cats. The main thing to be aware of with zonisamide is it is a sulfonamide derivative and it can cause some idiosyncratic reactions with the most serious one being a hepatopathy. It's very rare. It's thought to affect less than 1% of patients on the medication, but if it does develop, it is possible that it can be fatal. If it occurs, it's typically within the first few weeks of starting this drug. So I always recommend checking at least liver enzymes, if not a whole chemistry and CBC, a few weeks after starting the medication and compare that to blood work from before starting the medication. If there is a huge spike in liver enzymes, which there should not be with this drug, it does not actually induce um, significant elevation. If you see a big spike, then I would immediately stop this drug. Again, it's very, very rare, but, and if it happens, it's usually early on. So that's check blood work. If they don't have any problems early on, then they, they typically go on um, to do fine with this medication. So after that, I usually check um, their blood work every, every six to 12 months. I don't check levels. For this drug either, which is 
nice and, and saves clients a little money from not having to do that. And this drug has, it does have some hepatic um, metabolism, not like phenobarbital. It's only about 15% metabolized um, through the liver. The advantages to zonisamide are, are side effects are fairly minimal. They're more than with Keppra, but much less than with phenobarbital or potassium bromide. There's a fairly quick onset. Again, it reaches steady state in three to four days. It's less, less hepatotoxic. The disadvantages are the cost when we're talking about really big dogs. And it only comes in capsules that sometimes makes dosing a little bit more difficult unless you get it compounded, which significantly drives up the cost. But in our really big dogs, the biggest capsule is 100 milligrams. If we have a you know 100 pound dog, they may be taking five, six capsules twice a day, um, which is sometimes cost-wise, it's not all that bad, but difficult for, for people to give that many capsules. Gabapentin is technically an anticonvulsant. I do not use this um, as an add-on, except for very, very rare cases. I mean, there's the, the nice things about it are it um, usually has fairly mild sedation and ataxia. It's pretty inexpensive, but it's just not very, very effective in dogs. Also, if you're going to use it as an anticonvulsant, it has to be dosed three to four times a day to be effective. The half-life is very short. It doesn't require therapeutic drug monitoring, which, which is nice, um, like Keppra and zonisamide, but it, it does need to be dosed, um, again, at minimum three times a day, and it, it's just not very effective. If I have a patient that has needs medication for pain and they have seizures, I always tell clients, hey, maybe we'll get lucky and this will help control their seizures, but I don't reach for this drug as an anticonvulsant. I will, however, reach for pregabalin, which is similar to gabapentin, but is thought to, to be more effective. And it has a longer half-life, so it can be dosed two times a day. There's the potential that if it's not effective, you may have to try to give it three times a day, but it, but it has potential to be effective given twice a day. It started at two mgs per kg with one mg per kg in increases up to four mgs per kg. Side effects are similar to what we see with gabapentin. So the, the big thing with this drug is it's um, twice a day, so it makes it much more, more feasible, likely more effective than gabapentin. The downsides to it, the, the big one right now is cost. For some really small dogs, I've, I've used this and it's, it's not been terrible, but for a big dog, it's, it's pretty much cost prohibitive at this point. And it is a controlled substance. Uh, topiramate is another one. I'm not sure if anybody out there has used this. Topiramate is used for people as an anticonvulsant, and one of the side effects um, is weight loss. So it's actually marketed um, for weight loss in people. It's also used for, for migraines in people. The dosing is five to 10 mg per kg, two to three times a day. And so the, you can see the half life is very short. But again, this drug is thought to exert effects from the way that it, it binds that last much longer than what the half-life would suggest. I've not seen clinical weight loss in, in patients that I've put on this medication, and it doesn't happen in all people that are on it. Um, but I do warn people that that's a significant side effect um, in people just to be on the lookout of that um, in their dog or cat. But the nice thing with this drug is side effects are really minimal. While it can cause sedation and ataxia, I think it's minimal compared to drugs like phenobarbital and um, potassium bromide. I've never reached for this drug as a um, first line treatment, um, but I, I've had a few patients now where I've used this as an add-on. The nice thing about it, it's very inexpensive. 
It's again, twice a day, doesn't typically add much to side effects <clears throat> they may already be experiencing from their other anticonvulsants. The downsides is we, we just don't have a ton of information about this drug. There's been one study thus far that showed um, you know, decrease in seizure frequency in a subset of patients, but the, the true kind of effectiveness of this long-term, we just don't know. I put these drugs in here just in case it's something that comes up um, or clients ask you about. Pexion, which I'd be curious if anyone has ever used that thus far. It's It was approved in the U.S. for noise aversion think in 2019, um, but it's been used in, in Europe and Australia for seizures for quite some time. It's not approved here at this point for seizures, so it'd be off-label using it for seizures, um, but it's a drug that's thought to have similar efficacy to phenobarbital with less side effects, although some of the studies I was looking at in Europe um, there was multiple mention of dogs having aggression while on this medication. Um, so that, that would be a, a big thing to make a client aware of. I searched for this drug online at pharmacies and I cannot find it here, even though it says it's approved. So I'm not actually sure how, um, you know, available this is. And I, ha I have no idea of cost. That was something I was trying to, to figure out. Um, Felbamate was a drug that some people may be familiar with um, that was used um, not uncommonly, um, but it has since been kind of taken off the market pretty much for people, which has really driven up the cost. So I've never personally used this drug. There is an anticonvulsant that's been mentioned in, in people that was studied, um, lamotrigine, but it was found that it's converted to a cardiotoxic metabolite in dogs. So not something I expect us to, to see come up. And then Tegretol is something else that sometimes people bring up, but again, the half-life is super short. So I don't, I don't expect that to be something that we'll be seeing in, in our patients. When I am switching anticonvulsants, I guess, first of all, I, I don't tend to switch anticonvulsants unless I have a problem, um, like a patient that's on something like phenobarbital that has liver issues that we need to get them off of that. My preference is to start an anticonvulsant, maximize that drug. If we don't have good seizure control, then I add to that drug. I don't switch. I do see people switching anticonvulsants without ever adding. And when we do that, I think we don't ever know, would it be the combination of drugs that would have led to better seizure control when one drug by itself doesn't control seizures. So I don't, I don't switch unless there's a problem. If you are going to switch anticonvulsants, what I would recommend is starting your new drug and not decreasing the first drug until you know the new drug has reached steady state. So if you wanted to, for instance, switch a patient from phenobarbital to potassium bromide, you would need to keep the patient on phenobarbital, add on potassium bromide, and then you would not start weaning phenobarbital until that patient had been on potassium bromide for three to four months. When I wean phenobarbital, if, as long as it's not an emergency, I try to reduce it by about 25% every month. Occasionally I'll do it a little bit faster than that, but I try not to decrease the dose any faster than every seven to 10 days. The only anticonvulsant you don't need to wean when you're stopping is potassium bromide. And that's because the half-life of that is so long that it essentially weans itself when you stop it. I thought this was a very interesting and also kind of depressing statistic that I, I learned when I went to a um, talk by a human um, neurologist talking about epilepsy in people. And what they found is that about half of all people respond to the first drug that you pick. And it doesn't necessarily matter what drug you pick if you're using it appropriately. 
if they fail to respond to that first drug, their chances of responding to a second drug are only 13%. By the time you get to a third drug, there's only a 3% response rate. And I thought that was, that was again, very interesting um, and also depressing to know that if, if our patients just aren't responding to the first drug that we pick, that the likelihood that, you know, this next drug that we pick is going to, you know, make a big difference is pretty low. And I, I tell clients, we don't know, you know, these exact kind of numbers in animals, but I think it's, it's probably similar. Another thing that we probably don't ever think about in our patients is that I think we can sometimes see a placebo effect um, with with certain drugs. And there's actually a a study that was done um, in, I think it was just dogs with epilepsy, um, evaluating whether or not we can see a placebo effect. And it was found that almost 30% of, up to 30% of patients in a canine canine epilepsy trial had a response to the placebo, which I thought was fairly crazy. Um, But that's something to also keep in mind. I think sometimes when we start new drugs and patients are doing better, um, it's not always the, the drug. Sometimes it's the, you know, expectations of the owner. Epilepsy is a waxing and waning disease. And and sometimes these patients get get better um, despite us making changes. Sometimes, you know, you start a new drug and initially um, another thing that may play a role is these clients are more diligent. And then over time, they, you know, aren't um, given the medication on time or maybe missing some doses. So what are are reasons that patients don't respond to treatment? A big one is improper frequency or improper doses. One of those being Keppra, not being given every eight hours um, or underdosing patients. Sometimes it's just due to progression of the underlying disease, whether they have a, a a lesion in their brain that we have not identified. I think a big one is owner compliance as much as they come in and and tell us that, you know, they haven't missed any doses, they've been giving it. Um, I I don't think we always get the whole story. It's been shown that, you know, up to half of people with epilepsy do not take their own medication. So how can we expect clients to administer this medication to to their pets, you know, consistently? And then another one is, is drug interaction. So always check when you're starting, you know, medications, um, you know, are there any potential interactions with what they're already on dietary changes, which mainly is something that we see that can affect potassium bromide patients can develop, um, tolerance to these medications over time. That's thought to be a, a big thing with Keppra, but it can happen with any of these drugs. It it may be the specific drug that's not working well for that patient. So looking for a drug with a different mechanism of action, if they're not responding to, you know, the drug they're already on would be something to consider. And then lastly, you know, maybe these events are not, are not truly seizures. Again, not all dogs that are started on anticonvulsants or have to be on these for their entire life. People who are seizure-free for two or more years on therapy typically remain so when medication is withdrawn. We don't know, you know, is this similar for, for our patients? I think it's reasonable to consider tapering medication in an animal that's been completely seizure-free for one to two years, and that's completely seizure-free. If they have one even one breakthrough seizure during that time period, I would not consider weaning them off. But if they've been completely seizure free, you know, potentially we could, we could take them off meds. Now I I have some patients that are, you know, in that um, group, but most of the time when they're doing that, well, the clients don't want to stop drugs. They're scared of their animal, you know, having seizures again, they've been doing so well. Um, so, so most of them don't want to, and if they're tolerating the drugs, I think it's fine. 
But if you do consider tapering it, I would just do it very slowly. And if they have a seizure as you're tapering or once they come off, then I'd put them back on and know at that point, this patient's never going to come off medication. I thought we'd start um, or talk briefly about status epilepticus, which we don't see very often, um, but that's continuous seizure activity for at least five minutes or two seizures um, in between which there is no um, recovery of consciousness. A big thing to be aware of is if a dog presents in status epilepticus as their very first seizure event, that a toxicity is the most likely cause for that. If a patient's had a history of seizures, and that's different, but if their very first event of status epilepticus um, or seizures is status epilepticus, then um, toxicity should, should always be at the top of the differential list. Up to about half of all dogs with idiopathic epilepsy can either have cluster seizures or status epilepticus. It is more common in large breeds. If a dog has status epilepticus, especially if it's secondary to a structural lesion in the brain, the, these patients have about a 25% mortality rate. And it has been shown that even in a dog with idiopathic epilepsy, if they have a bout of status epilepticus at some point that their lifespan is on average three years less than that for dogs with idiopathic epilepsy that have not had status epilepticus. Our first line treatment for status epilepticus or, or active seizures, not necessarily just status, would be Valium. If you can't get IV access, that can be given rectally or intranasally, so it can be used at home for that purpose. We can also give Kepra IV since it has such a, um, a quick onset that that can be used. Phenobarbital can be can be given, um, but not it's not going to stop active seizures. Um, given IV, it has about a 15 to 20 minute onset time. So if a patient comes in seizuring and they are, you know, refractory to Valium. You can try a CRI. Most of the time, if they didn't respond to initial bolus of Valium, they're not going to respond to a CRI, which case we can go to propofol. Most patients respond to that. Pentobarbital, I have not used um, since, in, since I was in my residency, um, which I, I did have to use it once then. Um, and I hope to never have to use that again. Um, I've not had a patient that we, we couldn't get stopped by usually putting on, on propofol. And I mean, we use a lot of injectable Keppra um, now for patients that are actively seizing. At home, there are things that clients can do. I typically don't send home things like Valium unless a patient has a history of cluster seizures or really severe seizures that they've, you know, had to be hospitalized for. So I don't send this home for every patient with epilepsy, but if they've had a history of cluster seizures, especially if they've had to be hospitalized for it, I, I do try to have a at-home rescue plan together for these patients that often includes Valium, which can be given rectally or intranasally, it is not effective for seizures when you give it orally, especially not as an immediate medication. The big thing with Valium that sometimes makes it more difficult is you can't draw it up in a syringe and send it home for the client to use. It's been shown that Valium binds to plastic and starts to lose efficacy, I think as quickly as 15, 20 minutes after being in a syringe. So if you're going to send it home, I would try to do it appropriately. We send it home in a glass vial with an adapter on the top. Um, so then they can draw it up without a needle and then inject it at the time they need it. I tell people do not draw it up in advance. It, it may not be very effective. So that's for stopping, you know, seizures that are not stopping on their own or for the patient that has cluster seizures back to back. Another thing that can be done for patients that have cluster seizures is pulse therapy with Keppra. Um, the dose of that, this is only regular or immediate release Keppra, not the extended release. 
um, but it's 30 megs per keg three times a day until they're seizure free for 24 hours. Sub-Q Keppra is something that can be done as well. Um, I've had one client who um, was a nurse that whose um, dog had severe cluster seizures that we, we allowed to um, take Keppra home and give Sub-Q. That was the only thing that, that helped her dog and kept it from having to come to the hospital. Ocular compression can be done. It's just very, very transient, um, but clients often ask about that, and, and that can can help. Um, but again, as soon as they they stop applying the ocular compression, the effect goes away. Clorazepate is a drug that can be given orally, kind of similar to pulse therapy with Keppra. It's just a longer lasting benzodiazepine, and it's given three times a day until the patient's seizure free. So this is for 24 hours. This is something that's more helpful for patients that have cluster seizures that may be hours apart. So if I have a patient that has cluster seizures and you know they may have three, four seizures in a day, but their seizures are two, three hours apart, giving these patients rectal volume is not gonna do anything for them. The, the rectal volume works immediately, but within 20 minutes, it's not doing anything. So these are the patients that I'll have give a dose of clorazepate as soon as their dog is recovered enough from the seizure to take an oral drug. And they keep giving that drug until the patient has been seizure free for 24 hours. The other two benzodiazepines that can be given um, at home um, are lorazepam, which can go intranasally. It's a little bit longer lasting the diazepam. Um, we, we don't carry that drug. I don't, I don't have no idea the cost, um, but midazolam can be given intranasally. It does not work rectally. So that's the, the big thing is um, it, it does not go rectally, but um, it works very well intranasally. It's um, a smaller volume than, than Valium. So if you prefer, if your client prefers something intranasally, I would choose midazolam over Valium. We touched a little bit on, on cats. We, we definitely see idiopathic epilepsy in cats, um, not, not as often as in dogs, but it, it's still a fairly common cause of seizures in them. These are typically fairly young cats, just like in dogs. The big take home with cats is they, they can have classic tonic-clonic seizures, but they often have these more atypical seizures than what we see in dogs. Um, so they're... I, I feel like cat seizures take so many more um, different forms than, than what we see in dogs. When it comes to treatment for cats, we can use all the same drugs except for um, potassium bromide, which I don't recommend for cats. But we can use phenobarbital, Keppra, zonisamide, and zonisamide again can be given once a day due to the longer half-life, um, gabapentin, Again, not super effective, but is, is a potential option. And then pregabalin and topiramate. And Keppra um, extended release can actually be given in cats, which the, the dose is kind of crazy because, again, you can't go any lower than 500 milligrams. So if you have a, a 10 pound cat, you know, that's 100 mg per kg um, that year, or 500. 100 mg per gig, sorry, you're giving them um, the main, um, and, and it's been shown they tolerate it well, but I haven't found many clients who want to pill their cat with this big tablet every single day, because again, it can't be broken or crushed. Young animals can be treated fairly similar to our adult patients when it comes to treating them with seizures. By the time that they're four to six weeks of age, um, their, their liver is able to metabolize these drugs. Um, so they, they can take drugs like phenobarbital um, if they are young patients. Other treatment options um, apart from medications that we're going to kind of finish out on. Vagal nerve stimulation is kind of similar to a pacemaker in that it's a device that's implanted um, 
kind of into the neck and it stimulates the vagus nerve, which has been shown to desynchronize EEG activity. And so this is something that has been studied and has been shown to be effective in um, dogs. There's no side effects, which is nice. Most of the, the dogs where this has been implanted tolerated it really well. The downside mm-hmm. is this device is really expensive. Last time I, I checked on it, I was told it was about $12,000. Um, and I know of two neurologists in the country that, um, have experience with these that will do them. One I believe is in Arizona and the other, I, th- I think is somewhere on the East coast. Um, but I, ha- I had a client recently that looked into this, that was interested in this for their, their dog. And so they got me some of this information, acupuncture, There's been varying reports on whether that can help. When clients ask me about it, I personally tell them, I don't think it's going to hurt. I don't know that it's going to make a big difference, Um, but there's really no downside. If they want to try it, there's no side effects typically. So I'm I'm okay with, with people doing that. I do get um, a lot of questions about this, a ketogenic diet. Um, People you know, bring this up because I've read about it online or seen how um, it's worked in, in children. And there was actually a, um, a, a trial that was done in dogs with epilepsy that were, were fed a ketogenic diet. Um, this was not a commercially available diet. I don't know that there is a true ketogenic diet out there available for dogs. Um, so that's a big part is clients can't just go out there and, and buy a commercially available food. They'd have to make the, a food for their, their dog, which I know a lot of clients are willing to do. Um, but the big take home message is this was not found to be beneficial for dogs. And a third, there was only nine dogs in the study, but a third of them developed pancreatitis from this diet. So I, I do not recommend this. A medium chain triglyceride diet is something that has been shown to help. So if clients are really interested in um, altering their their pet's diet to try to gain better control of seizures, this is what I would recommend. And and this diet is what Purina NeuroCare is. So they actually did a randomized placebo-controlled double-blinded clinical trial and showed a pretty big reduction in seizures when dogs were being fed this diet. The downside to this is it's really expensive. Um, If there's other companies that come out, maybe it'll get less expensive. But I think um, right now it's really expensive, especially for a large breed dog. And you can't just add, you know, MCT oil to a diet that the dog is on um, and expect to have the same effects. I mean, this is probably only going to be achieved by feeding them a diet only made of medium chain triglycerides. There was a study that looked at um, adding omega-3 fatty acids to dogs. And the the take-home message from this too was that there was no difference in seizure frequency um, between the dogs on a diet um, supplemented with this and a a placebo group. So that's not been shown to be effective. Then probably the one that we all get asked about um, every day, um, about almost every problem that our patients have is, hey, can can we use CBD for this? Often um, clients come in and their dog's already on it. Um, but they may ask, you know, well, what do you think? Do you think this, you know, maybe I can get my dog off of their anticonvulsants. The big thing I, I tell people is that at this point, we just don't know. There's still a lot that um, I think needs to be determined. But there, I mean, there's two, two studies currently ongoing, one at Colorado State, and I believe one at the University of Florida, And the Colorado State group put out um, one study, results of one study, they they still have an ongoing study, but their initial study um, was randomized, blinded and controlled, and um, they did show a decrease in seizure frequency in dogs that were in the CBD group, but it was not statistically different from dogs in the placebo group. 
in their study, they thought that potentially a higher dose could be more effective or a longer period on um, CBD would be more effective. So they're, they're currently still conducting a clinical trial. I actually have one patient who is a um, Australian shepherd with severe refractory epilepsy who's on um, four anticonvulsants and was still having a lot of seizures. He enrolled in the trial and for the first few months of the trial, we did not see a decrease in his seizure frequency, but at this point, the dog's been seizure free for months, which he had not previously done. Whether that's from the CBD or not, I don't know. You know, that's also one patient, but um, ho hopefully we'll have some better information once they actually do their, their trial. Um, but, but right now I tell people, you know, we really, we just don't know. Um, we also don't know a dose. This it's also, I think if people want to use CBD, it's expensive if they're going to use a decent product and, and give, you know, a reasonable dose, it, it's going to cost as much, if not more than their anticonvulsants. And it should only be used as a supplement. I think some people think, you know, we can take a few drops of this and put it on their food and, you know, it's going to help. And, um, they're not, they're not really using it, um, in any sort of controlled fashion. So I think if people are going to be use it, use it and want to be serious about it, you know, we need to try to give them a dose and they need to use it consistently, but as a supplement to traditional anticonvulsants. And then recently there was an article that just came out talking about, um, using telmasartan um, as an add-on to anticonvulsants um, in dogs with epilepsy. Um, basically, what there was a kind of a precursor study that showed that dogs with primary epilepsy can have dysfunction of the blood-brain barrier. And I think it was a fairly small percentage. It was about 20% of dogs um, that underwent specialized um, kind of MRI had a, um, a leaky, they could show they had a leaky blood brain barrier. And we know that with leakage of the blood brain barrier, there's inflammation and activation of different glial cells in the brain. And it's thought that telmasartan helps block some of the kind of inflammation or activation of some of the cells in the brain if there is disruption of the blood-brain barrier. And so it may help enhance the efficacy of our anticonvulsant. So telomasartan in itself is not, you know, an anticonvulsant, but it may help if this is a patient that has disruption of the blood-brain barrier help, um, you know, decrease some of the effects of that. So, um, so far it was, there's been a clinical trial looking at 10 dogs um, put on this with the refractory epilepsy and they didn't come to a, much of a conclusion in the study, just said this may be effective and they really recommended proceeding with a, um, a larger number of dogs and doing a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. So I guess that's something that uh, we could look for on the horizon. Anybody uh, have any questions? I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. I do a lot of vaccine clinics and things like that. I've, I'm probably asked about once a week almost the best heartworm flea and tick um, medication for dogs that are in the breeds that are somewhat prone to have seizures with those medications. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I get asked that frequently and normally I'm being asked that by people that are coming to me whose dogs have seizures. And so if they're coming to me and it's a patient with seizures, regardless of whether it's epilepsy or secondary brain tumor, I mean, there are certain drugs that I tell them to avoid and it's, I have a list of them at my desk because I, I always forget, um, partly because I'm, I'm honestly not familiar with all the products out there anymore, but I know it's the Spinosad class, Brevecto, um, Cordelio. Uh, there's, I think, five of them. Um, so I know there are three of them that the FDA came out with that warning about, and I, 
So, but I tell people if their dog's not having seizures, I don't think you have to avoid those. I think the risk is super low. Um, but if I have a patient that's having seizures and already on those drugs, I mean, I don't absolutely even then tell them you need to get off these drugs. I mean, it doesn't mean it's going to make them have more seizures, but if we have a patient that's not super easy to control and they're taking something, you know, like Brevecto, I would recommend, you know, potentially switching. And I think the topicals are probably the safest for seizure patients to take any of the topicals. I guess where I work, I see a lot of farm dogs that are the border collie, um, you know, healers, all the sort of collie type breeds and almost every product comes with a warning for seizures. It's hard to know. Yeah, they, they do. And I mean, I think you could find that about almost everything. Um, but I mean, I, I tell people if they're not having seizures, I don't think you, you, you have to avoid those in a breed that could potentially have epilepsy if they've not had any history of seizures to that point. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.